KCRG TV 9's Our Town Road Trip is brought to you by Riverside Casino and Golf Resort, Great Jones County Fair, Community Savings Bank, Kettleson RV. Welcome to the KCRG TV 9 Our Town Road Trip. This summer we ask you to tell us where to go. We received some great submissions. And from those, we chose four. We're celebrating Rodeo Days in Edgewood. We're hitting the road with Ragbri Riders in Manchester. We'll stop for a snack at Fayette's Watermelon Days. And finish things off with a bang at Boomtown in Vinton. So there you have it. Four towns in four months. So join us aboard the Our Town RV. And let's get rolling. Welcome to Edgewood, the first stop on this year's KCRG TV9 Our Town Road Trip. On this stop, we'll see some businesses with local connections. We'll meet a few people with some great stories and get outside in a nearby state preserve. It's a little town with a lot of history. So let's check out Edgewood on this year's KCRG TV9 Our Town Road Trip. Our first stop in Edgewood is at the Edgewood Locker, well known throughout Northeast Iowa for processing beef, pork, and venison. Now in their third generation of workers, the Kearns family has been there from the beginning. Grand, right now we have Jason and Maddie here, and it's just really cool, and other grandchildren have worked in the locker as they grew up. Some are out in the workforce now, and, but uh, no, it's been great to think that you've passed this on, not only to our gener to our kids, but to the next generation. Yeah, we, uh, we grew up in the locker, and that was our, our job from when we were, uh, you know, 10 years on and up, so... The Kearns family opened this meat locker 44 years ago, and back then they only had four workers. Today they employ as many as 45, and they have 100 seasonal workers, most of them from the Edgewood area. Jim and Terry Kearns, brothers and owners of the locker, took some time to give me a behind-the-scenes look at their business. Beth, this is our processing area where we take the, the carcasses and, and prepare them for the family's needs. Okay, so this is where you have the animal, you're cutting it up, for example, that is, that is an impressive knife. What's happening here? <laughs> He's taking this chunk of round and cutting it up and getting it ready to, um, to package. So straight from here, it goes into the packaging and into the customer's hands when they buy it. Yep. But some customers want that distinctive barbecue flavor. That's where the smokehouse room comes in. So tell me about this room. You can smell that something's cooking. This is our smokehouse room. We have three automatic smokehouses. They're, um, they're just big ovens that create smoke and they cook all of our product okay. and, um, and give it that great smoke flavor that, you're, that everybody's looking for. These are huge. Yeah. It's like a refrigerator, but the opposite. <laughs> yep. These are, these are bacon um, that, are, that are done. They're just getting out of the smokehouse and they'll be ready to slice up and, and ready for breakfast. The Kearns family told me the company's success is due to the people. Edgewood is a close-knit community, just like the staff at their locker. Yeah, and that's, that's part of what has been, is why we've done okay or why we've succeeded is because all of those parts work so well together. It, um, they just kind of feed upon each other. If they go to an event and say, gosh, I liked that steak, then they come back and buy a steak. Or if they have a deer processed here, they say, gosh, I like that, and they'll come back and and have a hog processed or something because so all the different parts of the business do feed well together. Just north of Edgewood is a stretch of land with as many surprises as it has beauty. This is Bixby State Preserve, named after R.J. Bixby, a farmer, teacher, and legislator who donated the land for public use. On Sundays, would bring their ice cream freezer and their ice cream all mixed up chop some ice out of the cave and enjoy homemade ice cream down here. That was a big Sunday afternoon summer, summer family entertainment. That's right. She said ice in the summer. The ice cave makes this state preserve a destination. Even on the hottest days, there's ice hanging in the back of that cave. 
What Bixby State Park is most well known for is this ice cape. You can actually feel the cold air blowing out at you. It's like standing in front of an air conditioner. But what you might not realize is it has the most extensive and different rare kinds of plants in Bixby State Park than in any other woodland in Iowa. It became a state park in 1927 and a state preserve in 1979. The preserve designation has to do with the rare ecosystem that survives on these slopes. It's just been a, such an important part of Edgewood and the, the entertainment for Edgewood for so many years. And when you read the history, it's just kind of makes you have goosebumps because of all the people from so far and wide that enjoyed this park. It also has many options for outdoor recreation. Visitors can go fishing in Bear Creek, hike on one of the trails, or enjoy a picnic in the shelter. So if you're looking for a place to get away and see one of the rarest finds in Iowa, then look no further than Edgewood's Bixby State Preserve. In the past six years, athletic facilities in Edgewood have undergone a facelift, benefiting kids in kindergarten through high school. It's part of the Community Dreams Project. This million dollar facility began in 2004, and now the town has a new multi-sport athletic complex. President of Little League in Edgewood, Jason Jones, coaches a handful of teams from the town, so he understands just what this new facility means for people in the community. I mean, it's great. I mean, you like come down here and show off your new facility. I mean, <laughs> you know, other teams come and they're like, wow, this is really nice, you know. This new complex allows much more flexibility for the community. Before the project, scheduling games was difficult. Now, with the new fields, bleachers, and a concession stand, Edgewood can host many more events. This sports complex in Edgewood appeals to athletes of all ages. You have your football field and track, and of course, your baseball diamond. The project is nearly complete. All that's left on the school's wish list is lights for the football field and track, and fundraising for that is already underway. And with a community like this, it shouldn't be long before those lights are up for Friday night. I think they're real close-knit. Um, everybody comes together when something gets started. Everybody's always volunteering time, you know, to help out with anything in need. I mean, we could be out picking up rocks out of the diamond, and people are here to help, you know. The community, I mean, the people, the support you get around here, I mean, for the kids and everything. I mean, you've got a game. There's going to be a lot of people here to watch them. Now, thanks to the Community Dreams Project, there's plenty of room for people to watch the kids play. But playing games isn't all the kids like doing at the new sports complex. Oh, yeah, they, they like them. Concession stand, too. <laughs> While we were in Edgewood, we took a look at another local business that has really grown and made its mark in the community. Uh, celebrating our 100th year, and so back in 1910, uh, this bank began in a town called Little Port, Iowa. That this is the, the, the root of our bank. This is the philosophy of our bank is that, that this is how banking should be done. And if we would have uh, changed that, uh, I think we would have lost that sense of banking and community that we bring to this area, but also to the other areas we serve. Including. Well, our, our investment in this community is not only with a building, but with the people. I, I think the community of Edgewood is a, is a very vibrant business community, and I think it gives you a lot of optimism when you think about expanding your businesses. When we volunteer, we get involved in the community, and the, our community gets better because then we're trying to attract more people to move to our to our area or to bring their children here to go to school. And that's what the uh, people want is local. Uh, they want to be able to come in and see their, their, their neighbor working in the bank or whatever. If you're craving a home-cooked meal in an establishment with some character, you better check out Cafe Rosé in Edgewood. Owner Rosie Totman is also the cook and she'll even serve your order. And her building is a slice of Edgewood history. It was built as our bank in 1905. Uh, it was called the State Bank of Edgewood then, and um, in 1935 was changed to the Community Savings Bank. The dining room sits where everyone in Edgewood used to do their banking. This heavy door in the basement of Cafe Rosé never closes all the way for fear you never get it open again. This is the bank's vault. Today it's a storage space, but back in the day it held a lot of money. When I was in uh, my younger years, 
we used to get together for coffee at a local cafe in the morning and I missed that so I wanted to kind of bring that back to the people in Edgewood. And that's just what Rosie has done. Groups of people come from all corners of town to meet at Cafe Rosé. Customers come for the calm, cozy environment that resembles the town the cafe resides in. They eat lunch, play cards, or just sit down and chat with their friends. It's just a place that I wanted people to be able to come and relax and, and uh, enjoy conversation. So. Cafe Rosé offers a number of healthy dishes and she makes an effort to prepare meals from scratch. Her biggest seller? It's the meatloaf, believe it or not, and I never expected meatloaf to take off. So whether it's comfort food or the comfort of good friends, you'll leave satisfied at Cafe Rosé. You can bank on it. That cafe was full of history that we weren't expecting. Speaking of history, we wanted to hear the real story behind Edgewood's biggest event of the year, the Edgewood Rodeo. So we were off to talk with one of the men responsible for bringing it to town. The Edgewood Rodeo is something this whole town looks forward to all year round. When rodeo time gets closer, these people get excited. It's grown stronger each of its 23 years. And it's here, thanks in part to this man, Gerald Perenjacket. He was one of the people who brought the rodeo to town in 1987. We thought two, three years at maybe five to seven hundred people. And now we get up on the biggest night, over 3,000. To put that in perspective, 3,000 people is more than three times the population of Edgewood. In 1986, the town was looking for something for it to hang its hat on. They wanted an event that would be unique to the area, and it seems they made the right move in choosing the rodeo. Now it's something Edgewood is known for, but Perrin Jacket won't let you give him too much credit. <laughs> Not really the grandfather of the rodeo. Everybody was part of that. I can't take uh, credit for much of that. It's just by luck I found the rodeo people. That's about all I can take credit for. In addition to the three nights of rodeo, there's a demolition derby, a parade, games, rides, a golf tournament, and much more for visitors to enjoy. It's easy to see why people come from all around for this weekend. It's our identity. I mean, we kind of like to be known as the cowboys and cowgirls and um, just love fun. Uh, it, it brings people back. It's, it's so much, it's like Christmas. Everybody comes back for it and... Uh, they plan their summer around it. Well, a lot of people have got to make that kind of their summer vacation. <laughs> Even if you're not a cowboy or cowgirl, Edgewood Rodeo Days are sure to have something you'll enjoy. Two, three, three. <laughs> wow. That brings an end to this road trip. We uncovered some history and plenty of good food and found out why one big event can bring so many people to this small town. I'd like to thank the people of Edgewood for making this another enjoyable stop on KCRG TV9's Our Town Road Trip. Welcome to Manchester on this year's KCRG TV9 Our Town Road Trip. On this stop, we'll show you why one summertime activity keeps growing year after year. We're going to look at one fishy business, and we'll show you a few reasons why quilts are such big business around here. This beautiful town is full of things to do and people to meet, so let's get rolling on KCRG TV Night's Our Town Road Trip. Every Iowan knows that the summer season is fair season. As the 4th of July comes and goes, people in our town Manchester turn to their next big thing, the Delaware County Fair. And we spoke with Jeannie Domeyer, manager of the fair, and she told us that while fairgoers enjoy a week of fun, it takes a lot more than seven days to put it all together. Last month after the fair, and we worked on filling out and, and getting everything finished up and tidied up, and then about the next 11 months, we'll start working on entertainment and what we're going to do and how we're going to change things and what we're going to make better, and it's a long process. County fairs are a big deal here in Iowa, and of course the Delaware County Fair is no exception, with events ranging from livestock judging to motocross racing, and of course the big musical performances, there's always something happening here at the Delaware County Fairgrounds. I'm trying to find something for everyone. Um, so we have everything from a figure eight race that might, you know, might be something that uh, if you're big into cars and stuff you might be interested in, to a Christian concert tonight, 
onto a fight night with MMA fighting. If that collection of events doesn't catch your interest, then maybe the free Midway will. That's right. After paying admission at the front gate, you can check out the exhibits, livestock shows, and the rides at no cost. That's a big reason why the Delaware County Fair is one of the favorites for Eastern Iowans. We started this promotion last year, and people kind of look at me and they'll call me and they'll say, okay, what hours? <laughs> no, it's not a what hours thing. It's a every hour that the carnival's open all week long, our carnival rides are free. This year, you can get in uh, and do all the rides free with entry. So, I mean, that gets a lot of people here. Like, as you can see, the fair is really busy today. Of course, the kids love the free rides, but they're not the only ones who like the idea. The fair becomes even more enjoyable to parents who can save a little bit of cash. It can really add up. So to come here and say, yeah, you can ride one more ride and not have to say no, you know, it's a fabulous feeling. For more than a century, a staple for young people in Iowa communities has been the 4-H program. 4-H began as farmer's institutes for boys and girls who grew up around agriculture. Today, the Delaware County 4-H program includes more than 360 members, and in the summer, these kids get to put their hard work on display. It's great to see them all come out with all the different projects and their um, exhibits, and uh, things have been going great. Some kids come to the fair for the rides and the food, but these kids mean business. Whether they're showing cattle or horses, poultry, or even dogs, the kids and their animals are competing for that prized Grand Champion ribbon. But 4-H isn't only about the livestock. Areas of research and projects have grown tremendously since the early days of the organization, and 4-H is constantly adding programs to get kids involved. We have so many project areas. When I was in 4-H, you had your choice of three, and now we have almost 50 different project areas. And so we just have a project area for anybody's interest. This is my only livestock exhibits because I'm taking three cattle this year. I also have um, a visual arts project, a woodworking project, and uh, communicating through 4-H poster, which will go down to State Fair. It used to be that 4-H was just for the ag kids, the kids that lived on the farm, but now um, we like everyone to join 4-H. We have a little bit of something for everyone and so many areas, in, you know, from photography. Um, we have our new 4-H uh, clubs here in Delaware County for shooting sports and fishing and archery. So we're excited about those as well. You can just learn more about anything in 4-H. But even with all of these exciting new topics, the basis for the organization has remained the same. Education, fellowship, physical and moral development are still what this emblem stands for. We certainly want our kids to grow up. They're, they're our leaders of tomorrow, and we want them to grow up and be confident, um, to uh, have good responsibility skills, um, just be good citizens and uh, good ethics. Uh, it, it's all tied into 4-H. At one point, people in Delaware County had 10 different movie theaters to choose from. Now they have one, and at this time a year ago, the future of that one was even in question. But Al Remling and company would not let that happen. Well, we heard that the theater was going to be closing. Some of the that had gone to this theater in our younger years were excited about making sure that the theater did not leave town. Friends of Castle Theater is a nonprofit organization formed to take control of the landmark from Fridley Theaters of Des Moines. This volunteer group quickly took matters into their own hands. When this movie theater in Manchester almost closed last year, volunteers came to its rescue. They put in countless hours, giving it a new and improved look inside and out. The people were very supportive. We've had volunteers that are helping us in every way, from the very beginning with cleaning and papering and painting, and even uh, fixing the curtain so it will go up and down. That curtain went up on October 23rd, beginning the theater's first showing under new ownership. Since then, Remling has seen two of the three biggest crowds in the theater's history. But for this community, Castle Theater is about more than the numbers. Actually, I, I think that the city of Manchester really needed something to stay alive for our children. The feel of coming to an old movie theater, I think, is, is a good feeling. Out of curiosity, the staff started collecting zip codes at the door just to see how far out their audience reached. We've had as high as 18 zip codes in a given night. Uh, and oftentimes it's at least 13 or more. There's lots of small communities around Manchester, which is great. We'd like to see more people come to Manchester. So. When the volunteers fixed up the building, they restored more than just a movie theater for Manchester. 
they also reclaimed a landmark for the entire community. Our road trip takes us just outside of our town to the Manchester Trout Hatchery. This hatchery is responsible for supplying 400 to 500,000 young rainbow, brown, and brook trout. The fish go to rearing facilities in Al Qaeda and Decorah and to streams across the state. Dave Maroff showed me around the place and told me a little about the trout business. Fishing is as popular today or more popular than it's ever been. Uh, last year we sold more trout uh, fishing licenses in the state of Iowa than we ever had previously. Manchester lies in what is called a driftless area. It's a 40,000 square mile area of northeast Iowa, southeast Minnesota, and southwest Wisconsin, an area that was not affected by the last glacier 15,000 years ago. So what does that really mean? We have spring-fed cold water trout streams. Perfect for trout. Perfect for trout. In 1880, the U.S. government sent a representative to look for the first site to build the first federal fish hatchery in the upper Mississippi River watershed. The choice? Well, you guessed it, Manchester. Believe it or not, the hatchery is actually a big tourist attraction in the Manchester area. Being more than 100 years old with renovations in the 1950s, it gives families an opportunity to see how they raise and supply these fish to trout streams in eastern Iowa. We're never surprised to see any state in the parking lot <laughs> license plate out here. Uh, and the public is welcome to come out, uh, feed our fish, uh, enjoy the surroundings. But people aren't the only visitors that like to stop by the hatchery. Here's why the fences are up. Great blue heron tracks. We do have predators that come in here. Great blue herons are the worst because they spear fish. It's not uncommon to see uh, a dozen or 20 herons flush off of here when we come down first thing in the morning. The Manchester Trout Hatchery, a popular destination for humans and animals alike. Quilting is something that's popular all over eastern Iowa and beyond, and our town Manchester is no exception. We spoke with Kathy at the quilt maker shop, a woman who knows a thing or two about quilting. Well, I've been quilting since I was a senior in high school and, and wanted to take up um, quilting because my grandmother quilted and stuff, and it, it was an interesting extension of my sewing. Not only is the quilt maker shop a place where people can pick up the supplies they need, but it also holds regular classes so they can improve their quilting skills. People to start with the beginning classes where they just get familiar with the terminology and uh, the basics of measuring and so on. And then we have paper piecing classes and applique classes, everything from the beginner all the way to the accomplished quilter. So just what is it that's made quilting so popular for so long? Well, I think it's, uh, again, uh, home ties, well, we you know, trying to okay, connect with the past <laughs> and our heritage. Um, also, it's a very creative field, and people are, need an outlet to express their creativity, and, the, and it's an excellent way to work with colors and fabrics and patterns. Some people like to express their creativity on a different stage. The barn quilts of Delaware County is an example of that. They put their patterns on, you guessed it, barns and other farm buildings. Basically, it's a, an act of trying to promote tourism to Delaware County. Uh, first of all, and I think secondly, or maybe just as important, is to for people to show pride in their, their facilities, their, their barn or their it's building or whatever it is, their homestead. Delaware County yeah, was like only county the fourth program. county in Iowa to form a barn quilt group, and that was just two years ago. But already you can find more than 30 quilt patterns on farm buildings all over the county. You know, most of the buildings in the rural areas like, like will be red and white, or white or red oh. or, or some variation of that, and so we try and encourage a lot of colors. So right one right there, right there, right there, right there, it attracts their attention so and it gets noticed and people say, what are you doing? Look at that. Always a new technique for something new and exciting out there to try. And with quilts moving from beds to barns, who knows what's next? The Maquoketa River that winds through our town Manchester is a beautiful sight, as is much of this community. And now, thanks to one Manchester resident and a book, this town is looking to improve even more. Yeah, we have a really nice setting. Uh, like I said, we've got a lot of nice things now. We're just hoping to take it that next step and make it great and uh, make sure everybody has an opportunity to come to Manchester, Iowa. The book is called Good to Great, and it's the inspiration behind a program that's giving Manchester a facelift. 
because the opening sentence in this book kind of states it all. It says, good is the enemy of great. And it's that complacency that we wanted to make sure we moved beyond that and found ways and identified areas that we could improve you know, our community. Leo Monahan and his group agree that Manchester has always been a good community. But making that transition from good to great involves a lot of people and their ideas. And that's what this program is all about. What those committees presented was just the tip of the iceberg. It's from the large numbers of people that come together with great ideas that things really happen that they want and that make a difference. To improve academics in Manchester, the group developed an academic booster club. They also plan to install an access ramp along the riverfront for kayakers. Banners, welcome signs, and clubs for archery and fishing are also in the works. And the group hopes that with additions like these, more people will see the value of this community. I've lived here for a number of years. I've liked living here, but I've also seen a lot of people say there's not a lot to do around town. Uh, we need to go out of the community for events. And really looking around, there's no reason the people from Cedar Rapids, Waterloo, Dubuque, they can't be coming to Manchester and enjoying what we have to offer here. And their efforts are getting attention. What, what is so gratifying is so many people, some who've never been involved before, have said this is something we'd really be excited about. This is some area in which we can make a difference. And that's what I think it takes to make a small town be a great town. Well, our road trip has now come to an end. We've met some great people with some really interesting hobbies, and we found out why this town strives to improve each and every day. And I'd like to say thank you to the people of Manchester for helping us share their stories on KCRG TV9's Our Town Road Trip. Welcome to Fayette, the third stop on this year's KCRG TV9 Our Town Road Trip. We're going to learn about a few local legends and see how a university continues to help this community grow. I'll also tee up with a few local golfers who are going to give me a few pointers and we might even hear a ghost story. There's a story around every corner in this town, so join me for the KCRG TV9 Our Town Road Trip. Good. Everybody doing all right? If every town has a flavor, in Fayette, you'll find it at a local favorite, Boykies. We stopped by to see just what makes this place so special. He tricked me. <laughs> Because we owned a restaurant in Ashen, and he said, we should have another restaurant. I said, no, we're not going to have another restaurant. And one day he took me for this ride and wound me all around everywhere, and we ended up down there, and I go, oh, that's a really nice place. We should look at it, and that's how we got in town. A peek at the menu may be a bit overwhelming. Regulars have a hard time picking a favorite, but one specialty always gets rave reviews. Well, Dave's ribs are to die for. And, you know, there's famous Dave's ribs, and then there's Dave's famous ribs. If napkins are in short supply, their pork tenderloins and better than roasted chicken always get the thumbs up as well. And you simply can't walk out the door without dessert. At Boyke's Restaurant, you can come in and order a sit-down meal, but they're also available for carry-out or catering. But whatever method you choose, make sure you get a slice of their delicious pie. We were lucky enough to try the ribs, the tenderloin, and the pie. And as we looked around the room, we had to ask Dave and Deb about the coffee mugs. The regulars like to come early, so we open at 7 in the morning, and they start coming in about 10 after 6. Most of those people that are early, early morning crowd have their own coffee cup. They have their name on their cup, and they go get their own cup. Sometimes they fill it themselves. <laughs> we have fast, friendly, efficient self-service here. So. The Boykies tried operating two separate restaurants for two years, but they quickly realized that working together was the way to go. It's fun. And, and it's entertaining for the customers. When you get done. Because he, well, he likes to pick on me, and he, I'm not a morning person, so he likes to push my bills early in the morning by pushing the bill. And so you know what I want to do with that bill. The, the more we pick at each other, the more the customers like it. So. No <laughs> well, sometimes sure. I think that's what they come for, is the entertainment. <laughs> if you get a funny feeling walking through Colgrave Walker Hall on the Upper Iowa campus, you're not alone. In fact, you may have found the ghost on campus, or we should say, she found you. I have no explanation. Zanita Graf Bailey graduated from Upper Iowa nearly 100 years ago, but legend has it, she never left. Zanita's pictures and belongings still sit at Upper Iowa, including a trunk, like which is where Professor Jerry Wadian says this ghost story, story starts. Well, the trunk, CGB, Zanita Graf Bailey's, and it was 
locked and it had a handle and we used it in just a lot of theater productions but there was something in this thing you could go like this you could hear something slide in it you could hear it hit the side you could you know it would rattle there was a heavy object in there i was hoping it was a diary the curiosity got the best of them so jerry took it to a local blacksmith he puts it on the bench breaks the locks we open that thing up and there's nothing in it after that this trunk was never used again on stage for another production but legend has it that zanita's spirit continues to haunt the halls here at upper iowa and even though she never performed in this theater zanita seems to feel right at home on stage we had the portable light board out we're checking which line went to which light i'm saying well that's not the right one turn it off uh boss it is off no turn it off the light's on no boss, look he'd taken the cord out of the light he's holding the cord and the light's on it's not possible and the spooky stories don't stop there wadian told us two students were alone on stage taking a break from a run-through they heard music playing and looked down to find a tape deck playing on stage suddenly right before their eyes it stopped i don't explain it i have no explanation i know it's not logical it's not probable it's not likely but i know what happened and if the legends are true, so does Zanita. What do you think of the outfit? Great, look great. Look like a golfer? You do, definitely do. Good luck. Okay. I got a hat. Make me look more like a golfer, which is good because I may not play like one. Now you were a basketball coach and a baseball coach. Both. You're my golf coach today. Fine. Can I call you coach? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. <laughs> Most of them do that. Ladies, go first. If you lay out, if you go in the water, then you got to go to the circle. Oh, okay, that's good. I might need that. What if I don't get to the water? Bring it back, hit it again. All right, I'm going to give this a try. Strike one. Right down the middle. That doesn't count. Oh, I thought you were going to make it across. But that's a free drop on the other side, right? Yes, ma'am. Yep. Okay. You gotta teach me to hit over the water. How do you think this golf course compares with others in Northeast Iowa? I personally think it's one of the finest ones around. That's why we get a lot of play. A lot of people love to come here. One guy told me that well, he likes our greens so well, he'd only if he lived here, he'd only go home to do the laundry. <laughs> At least so. he'd do the laundry. It's more like bowling, really. Supporters of Big Rock Country Club donated the money for these stones that you'll see at the tee boxes on the back nine. And it's easy to see from looking at this course that the support here is well above par. Upper Iowa gave $50,000 to the part that it breaks on down. And a lot of people gave $1,000 and then there's $100 people. And then, so we'll still accept golf balls by anybody who comes by and wants to contribute to our course. Nice shot. Oh, what a, look at this. Great putt. Oh, it's a very positive uh, benefit to the community. Uh, just uh, about every weekend there's some event out here, uh, either uh, reunions, uh, things like that, family gatherings, also uh, people playing. So, uh, yes, very positive. Nice one. The most gratifying sound I've ever heard. <laughs> there you go. Good job. Good putt. Good coaching by Billy there to tell you how to putt. These troops returning home a week ago from a tour in Afghanistan can tell you how much something from back home means to them. That's why Carla Gavin is doing her part to make nights overseas feel a little more like home. She began making sleeping bag inserts to send to the troops, and in return, she's received many thanks. We received several photos of the individuals who received them and have them posted in my office, so it's a nice reminder. These inserts go inside the sleeping bag, making them easier to clean and maintain. Carla knew an Upper Iowa student stationed in Afghanistan, so she sent a trial version, and it took a little experimentation. They said that the full size worked much better in the sleeping bags. The, the queen size got a little, they got a little lost in it. But once she got it right, she began is. sewing up a storm. <laughs> I made about 45 of them nice. myself, and then I contacted the Fayette Legion Auxiliary and asked if they would like to participate in the project. And so they have made 
another 45. So we were able to meet our goal of 90. Carla joined forces with yeah, Gina Four, and together they sent out letters to locals asking for assistance. Many of those who couldn't sew made sure to contribute a little cash. What a perfect opportunity. We can have our fundraiser, we can set our funds aside, and then as we can buy more sheets, purchase what we need, and just keep this going. Gina says the original idea is what caught the attention of many contributors. You don't, you don't think about it, but yeah, you know, I have a special pillowcase that I take when we go camping. So yeah, you know, yeah, bed sheet, that's a great idea. My father's in the military, so I know what it's like for them to be away from home and how important this stuff is to them. And so the more stuff we can get to the guys and the ladies, the better. Because wherever you are in the world, a good night's sleep is always appreciated. Enrollment at Upper Iowa University is booming, and as the student population inches toward 1,000 strong, it's possible students can soon outnumber the school's hometown of Fayette. That's why a strong connection between the school and the community is so important. As the city of Fayette goes, so goes Upper Iowa, and we want to make sure that our students are having uh, rich opportunities for internships and real work experience. We understand very well that either one of us uh, is not going to be as successful without a strong partnership. Our president knows that, we know that, and we work on that every day. Lots of towns have a strong connection between the university and the community, but few are as strong as Fayette and Upper Iowa University. Three years ago, the university established the Upper Iowa Business Development Grant. It began thanks to a $500,000 gift from Bob and Betty Firth. Upper Iowa provides grants to businesses that want to improve or build in Fayette. So the university is booming. We don't think there's any reason why the city of Fayette can also take advantage of the opportunities uh, that the growth of Upper Iowa uh, has. The proof lines Fayette's Main Street at this storefront next to Fayette Flooring, at this brand new funeral home. And this year, grant money is supporting a new restaurant and sports lounge, which will also be home to a new school logo store and coffee shop. The university hopes that this project brings more people to Fayette and encourages students to stay close after graduation. We bring a lot of students in to come to our schools, but then they leave. I want to reverse that trend. Upper Iowa wants to reverse that trend, and we're doing it in Fayette. At our request, Upper Iowa Athletic Director David Miller recently spent some spare time trying for bluegills at Volga Lake. We'll just see what happens. We'll just see what happens. Most of his time is devoted to running the school's athletic department. The Peacocks are the only Division II program in the state. They compete in the Northern Sun Conference. We're trying to educate folks, you know, the people in the state of Iowa on Division II athletics and how highly competitive Division II athletics is. Not only can we give scholarships, but we can give partial scholarships. We can stack so we can we can give some athletic money, we can give some academic money. So in a lot of ways we can get very, very creative. And a fish just jumped over there. So I don't, but it's not anywhere where we need it. Back at his office in Dorman Gymnasium, a picture of all the Upper Iowa athletes dominates the wall behind Miller's desk. And it reminds me every day of why I come in here and why I'm sitting in a chair in the end. Quite honestly, the responsibilities of sitting in this chair. Miller says the school's administration backs the athletic department and its mission, which involves stressing academics, being competitive in athletics, and character development. We are developing these young men and these young ladies, um, quite honestly, for life after athletics. Our, our kids aren't going pro. They know that. In a few days, the students arrive back on campus, which means Miller's time with a fishing pole will be limited. At this point, I think we'll be happy if a fish even wants to just um, play with the hook. Near our town, Fayette, John Campbell, TV9 Sports. You won't make it far in the history of Fayette without hearing the name Charles Coleman Parker. In the 19th century, he was a professor and board of trustees member at Upper Iowa, a founder of Fayette, and the town's first doctor. In fact, a modern-day professor, Richard Barker, wrote a book about Parker called At Stormy Time. Most of it, him, like he was visiting with Charles Parker in his office at Upper Iowa, and uh, so it kind of uh, tell, told about life stories and, and uh, 
it was really a kind of a neat turn to, to do it that way, I think. One of the oldest buildings still standing in town is Dr. Parker's office on Main Street. Years of disrepair left behind little more than a pile of bricks. It was uh, really in quite bad shape, but I think I looked beyond that because I look back at the pictures now and I'm going, oh my, <laughs> that was really bad. <laughs> quite the project. It, it was. It was about a year-long project. And uh, I just, like I said, I, I got into the history of it. I fell in love with the, the architecture of the building, the history of the building, the character of the building. And it just, it just became a passion. And thanks to Sharon Orr, it's home to a brand new Northwestern Mutual office. So I really had a, basically a, a shell, a limestone foundation and a brick shell. But we kept the structural integrity that was always here, so it looks like it's always looked. These are some of the items that Sharon found while she was doing her project. These were all found underneath the back steps. One of them was this Vaseline bottle that when she found it was still full of Vaseline. Sharon wanted to maintain the historic feel in the office and she did just that by incorporating original pieces of the Parker building. The furnishings in here are what I could salvage so the tabletop is part of the old floorboards. The bookcase is from the old floorboards. My Here's desk is also made out of the old floorboards. All features that remind her of how far this building and the town of Fayette have come. The road trip through our town Fayette has reached an end. While in town we heard a few stories, ate some great pie, got some fresh air, and even got a few tips on a tea box. Thanks to the great people of Fayette, this town was yet another fun stop on KCRG TV9's Our Town Road Trip. Welcome to Vinton, the fourth stop on KCRG TV9's Our Town Road Trip. We'll putt our way through the state at a local golf course, take off on a new age treasure hunt, and we'll find a few reasons why this is such a strong and close-knit community. This town is full of fun things to do and great people to meet. So let's get things started on KCRG TV9's Our Town Road Trip. In Our Town Vinton, one of the landmarks that'll catch your eye is the Palace Theater. The building opened in the early 1900s as a theater, then closed down in 1972. It then served as a bakery and a gym, but after a $500,000 community campaign and renovation, it reopened in the fall of 1999 again as a theater. I think a lot of people said, oh, it can't be done. There's no way. You'll never make it work. And uh, it happened. It took a couple of years. It took a few years to raise that money, but they did. And the theater just started out and was immediately successful. The theater receives great support from Benton and surrounding communities. We can sell out. If we open our doors at 6 o'clock, we can be sold out by 10 after 6. So, it, you know, there's... 193 seats, but they go fast, for, especially for a good movie. Because of this great support, the theater has been willing to try some new things. The latest, digital projection and 3D movies. And in those four years, it's really become apparent to us that um, digital is the way to go. This is a definite community asset for Vinton, and um, the community feels real ownership about the palace. And we, you know, we raised the money to do the digital in just two months. Here at the Palace Theater in our town, Vinton, there's a show every day, but what they're really known for are their prices. It's just $2 for a regular show and $3 for a 3D movie, and they say that's the cheapest around. But I think we're the only $3 3D in the area. In the world, we say. The so only $3. Deal yes. The theater also hosts many productions by Act One of Benton County. Performers call the Palace Theater home after years of traveling to different performance venues. The combination of a movie and performance theater helped raise the money for the renovation of the building. We knew that the community could not support a facility like this for community theater only. So what do you put with it that will pay the bills and allow those creative people in the community to have a venue to do um, theater? So whether you're looking for the latest Hollywood productions or to see a few friends up on stage, the Palace Theater is the place to go. All right, well, I'm here with Dwayne now, and he's going to uh, show me the ropes here at the miniature golf course. He even gave me a pink ball to play with, so I'm really, really <laughs> excited about that. I went orange. Okay. All right. All right, let's good, go. Good, good, good. Our, okay. our first hole is in kind of commemorative of the Pella Tulip Festival. Um, as each hole is going to be a different site in Iowa or, or showing off some different people in Iowa. So you got to go through a windmill and the tulips and everything. Got to time it just right. And it's a par two. Par two. Boy, that might be kind of, do you want to go first? Ladies first. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> if you beat you me, got... you get a free slushie. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Did I get it? Yeah. Hole in one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm off to a good nice. start. That's good. 
they said to be nice and let you win, so that's why oh, I did that. Oh, okay, thank you. Our next oh, hole is, uh, is uh, the effigy mounds okay. um, from over in the Marquette area and so on. Oh! oh yeah! <laughs> nice work! When you come to this mini golf course in our town, Vinton, you really get a trip around the entire state. It takes you from the bridges of Madison County to the Field of Dreams, to the state capitol in Des Moines. Made two trips to Des Moines to make sure what it looked like exactly and, and come back and built it. So you know. Yeah, down to the I, gold dome. I, I think it's it. unbelievable. And, and I won't say that we're the toughest miniature golf course in the state, but I think we're the most unique. Yeah, oh, for sure. Now, all this stuff was made locally. We had local people make all the structures for us and everything. It was Everybody fun watching it develop. Helped, and so it, was, it was just neat to watch it happen. In our grand opening, we had somebody from every place here representing. I mean, people from the universities, from the grotto came, you know, people came from all over the place. We set up a little Ragbri station here to honor Ragbri. Nice. And then you can't hardly have a, something in Iowa without a deer crossing. Oh, yeah. If people donated to the project. They could check off what their favorite university was, and that's the order they were going to be in here. So as the funding came in, Iowa was the top one, then you and I, then Iowa State. People come in that are visiting from out of town, maybe not a state even, and they come in and say, oh, man, this is great, and they come and play. And so it's, it's a... It's just a little jewel we have here in Benton, I think. On our road trip, we decided to hop off the RV for a bit and explore the old Creamery Nature Trail that begins right here in our town, Benton. The trail's 15 years old and 15 miles long, and thanks to a new trail activity called geocaching, it's more popular than ever before. We met up with a few experts from Benton to show me the ropes. Geocaching's the big thing on the old Creamery Nature Trail, and there are about 50 caches hidden along the whole trail. The key is finding them, and that's why you have a GPS. It makes it kind of like a high-tech treasure hunt. Usually you can find them fairly easy. Well, and if you didn't know, you know, that what you were kind of looking for at this distance, you wouldn't probably, you'd probably no, ride, you'd ride walk right by it. it. Yeah, people go by them every day. And that's exactly what I almost did. Luckily, my GPS was there to help me out. Oh, what oh. happened? Five feet. Daryl okay. turned around. Now, when you're hunting for a cache like this, you got to think, well, where would I hide something? It's logical. Sometimes it might be under the grass. Sometimes yeah. it might be on an obstacle that's right near you. What you would want to do is look a little bit closer where you might try and find it somewhere. Ah, ah you found it. Great. <laughs> Your first geocache. Your first Very geocache. Good. And in this log, you sign it, date it, you found it this date, this time. Most people don't use their real name. So Shabs and Muffkin 42 times 2 helped me on my way to my second cache. But this one took a little more effort. Obviously I'm a novice. Got it. Okay, I'm coming out now. Do you want me to sign it before you sure. take it? All right. Sure. I'll, I'll leave my spot on two geocaches. I was satisfied with finding only two, but these guys have located thousands of caches all across the country. You guys put a lot of work into this. Yeah, there's a lot of fun in it. We enjoy it tremendously. I've been doing it for since uh, 2005. My wife and I have found uh, 3,000, almost, almost 3,400 of them in the five years busy. that we've been doing it. Yeah. So set your GPS toward the old Creamery Nature Trail in our town, Vinton, to check out the next big thing in treasure hunting. As we rolled through our town, Vinton, we met up with Brian Parr, a local craftsman with a unique hobby. This one here is going to be a grizzly bear. Brian is an artist. He creates sculptures of many shapes and sizes out of wood. But it's the tools he uses that might catch you off guard. How long does it take you to do one of these? Oh, usually a day. So you get all these grooves cut and everything in just a, a yeah, day? Yeah, everything's done with a chainsaw. Okay. It's wow. a lot quicker, so everything is done with a saw. <laughs> Usually on a tree, I'll use a big saw. But this is just a standard chainsaw. Nothing special about any of it. So you do all that grooving. I mean, it's just... You do it by eye, wherever you think it needs to be more and... Yeah, just keep taking away where it needs it. And Most people might think of having to break out the chainsaw as a hassle or a chore, but to Brian Parr, he thinks of it as a tool. A tool he's going to use to create a masterpiece like this. So do you typically stain um, all these when you're done? I usually burn everything and then 
brush it down, it makes it soft and it makes the fur stand out a lot better. And don't think he's just some guy with a saw. This guy's done his research. On a grizzly, they don't show as much between the legs as a black bear. So there's, there's a little bit of difference, you know, if you're doing a grizzly or a black bear. Is the black bear smaller or bigger or uh, same size? Smaller, but smaller. they're more lanky and the head's more like a dog. Brian's attention to detail has made him a big name, not only in Vinton, but across the country. They're all over the United States. I've got bears out in Montana and things up in Canada, all over the United States. And what most people are after are his very tame bears. I wouldn't want to have a run in with him. <laughs> At least not if he was a real guy. This guy yeah. I can handle. <laughs> yeah. If you're a fan of oldies music, or good old fashioned food for that matter, then Leon's Malt Shop in our town Vinton is a must stop. We pulled over for lunch and we're in for a surprise. And do you try and be like a 50s diner kind yes. of style? Yes. I love the rock and roll 50s. Yeah, the rockabilly yeah. era. Yes. Yeah. Whether it's the car sitting out front, the Coca-Cola wallpaper, signs and posters on the walls, or the red checkered floors, this restaurant is all about the good old days. Just atmosphere is the biggest thing. Mm -hmm. um, the customers help make it that way. They're always bringing in old bottles or antiques and giving them to me, so it's, it's kind of neat. And if you like to jive to the Golden Oldies, you're in for a treat. Here at Leon's Malt Shop, it's like you stepped back into the 1950s. While you're waiting for your huge tenderloin or chocolate malt, you can listen to some tunes on the jukebox, too. Locals will tell you that the tenderloin is the food of choice. But as for the malts, you might get a few different opinions. We'll make up whatever you like. There's people that you bring in their own candy bars and this, and we'll make their own ice cream for them. So, okay. Uh, what, what is your most popular seller? The black raspberries are most popular, butterscotch and caramel. Okay. But we have a variety of stuff. People like mix and match. So. so whether you're looking for a good malt, a good tenderloin, or just want to hear that favorite song from your childhood, Leon's Malt Shop is the place for you. Gloria McNaughton has been a resident at Windsor Manor in our town Vinton for five years. When she came to this assisted living development, flying an airplane was the last thing on her mind. But now, thanks to Operation Dream Builders, residents here are getting the chance to do things they never imagined. Very excited. I didn't think anything like that would ever happen. Had you flown before? Or? Oh, I had my own pilot's license when I was 17. Bethany Clemenson, the manager at Windsor Manor, contacted Mark and Kimberly Noe, pilots from Vinton who have their own plane. Soon after, the Noe's were high in the sky with Gloria in the passenger seat. So I think we got more enjoyment out of it than maybe she did. I'm not sure she, uh, she really enjoyed it, but it was a definite pleasure for us to help her out. But we were up for what, uh, maybe what, 30, 45 minutes, something like that. But uh, even five minutes, I'd have been excited. <laughs> With Operation Dream Builders, staff members at Windsor Manor ask the residents what their dreams are. Many of them initially would say, I've had a great life, I don't really have any dreams anymore. But um, after you would talk about things, then they would come up with, you know, I always wanted to be a teacher, or I wish I could fly again. And then they take those dreams and make them a reality. For some, their dreams to fly again. For others, it's as simple as a weekly trip back to the farm. I love it. I, that's all I can say. It helps you just, you oh, know. Help me get through the day. Very unexpected when I moved in here, but it's, I think it's a great thing for them to do this for us. It's been an amazing experience. I, I've been overwhelmed with the support of the community, and that's just venting for you. With that, the KCRG TV9 Our Town Road Trip has reached its final destination. While in town, we found a few ways to enjoy the great outdoors, sat down to a retro meal, and heard the story of one man's great recovery. Thanks to the great people of Vinton and to all the towns we visited for making this another great summer on KCRG TV9's Our Town Road Trip.